And I'm so excited uh, to introduce today our two fabulous, exciting panelists. Um, today, we've got Lydia Bell. Uh, Lydia is the Associate Director of Research Academic Performance at the NCAA. She received her PhD from the University of Arizona in Language, Reading, and Culture. And her dissertation was entitled Balancing Acts, Negotiations of the Athletic and Academic Role Amongst Division I Football Bowl, Football Bowl Division Student Athletes, uh, where she used role identity as a theoretical framework to um, examine over time how student athletes have shaped their athletic and academic role identities uh, using both quantitative and qualitative skill sets in her dissertation. Our other fabulous uh, Panelist today is Elizabeth Betsy. Now, is it I, is it Labiner? I just realized I wrote in. It's Labiner. I got to thank you. Uh, who's the director of education at the Scoundrel and Scamp Theater? And she received her PhD in English literature, also from the University of Arizona. And her dissertation was entitled uh, and still is uh, "Carved Out in Bloody Lines: Interiority, Truth, and Violence in Early Modern Drama." Uh, and she examined uh, dramatic presentations of truth and truth telling as they can connect to interior spaces, including the heart, the theater, and the uterus, um, and argued that the theater as a heart helps us provide the power of drama and its role in social criticism during the early modern era. So you can see both of our panelists today began with uh, amazing academic experiences um, in their field, and we're delighted to have them all here with us today to talk about uh, their very interesting and diverse career paths. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. I see some people already active on the chat, which is great. Um, my name is Lacey Neymeyer john I oversee alumni career and professional development, and it is, I am so honored to work with Sean on this project and to bring these great alumni to this discussion. Really excited for the questions that we're going to get to in just a little bit. So the way that we're going to structure our event today is that we're going to stay together in an open discussion format. And we would love to kind of gear the conversation to questions that are relevant to you and questions that you have in your career journey right now. So feel free to use the chat to submit questions for our panelists. And Sean and I will kind of work through those um, and try to get to as many as we can. Um, we might not get to all of them, <laughs> but if we don't, we'll be sure to maybe follow up and help you get the answers that you need. So Lydia, Betsy, the first question that we have today is maybe talk about transferable skills and introduce you know, your journey to where you are today, where you are today and maybe discuss some of the skills that you developed during your degree program into how you're using them in your career, um, career now. So uh, Betsy, do you maybe wanna start off the discussion? Yeah, my pleasure. So I began working at the theater where I'm now the director of education while I was still working on my degree. And my path there started actually as just a person working in the box office for a few hours a week during shows. And then while I was already working there, I just started chatting with the managing director of the theater. And he mentioned that he was looking for someone to help with their grant writing. And I had a little bit of grant writing experience courtesy of having applied for GPSC grants and a couple of other small grants. And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I have some grant experience, but mostly I'm just a good writer. Sure, let's take a crack at this. And so I became the grant writer for the theater. And then as it approached the end of my degree, I was having a very hard time on the job market and did an informational interview with a director of education at the Atlanta Shakespeare Company, because I knew that I wanted to stay in education in some way, but was really feeling like academia wasn't a place for me at this time, both because of the limited job opportunities and just because I wanted something that was more community oriented. And so I spoke with this wonderful woman in Atlanta and she, after talking with me and learning about where I was, basically said, 
you're the grant writer, you're already indispensable to this theater, tell them what you want, ask for it. And that felt incredibly daunting to me, but she totally pepped me up and was like, here's how you do it. And so I went into a conversation, I emailed the managing director and basically just said, hey, I know that this theater is too small to need a full-time director of education. I have this idea where I can basically divide my time between multiple theaters here in town and be the director of education maybe for you and for the Rogue and for a couple other people. And he responded in probably the best way imaginable, which is, I like half of that plan, but we don't want to share you. So <laughs> they actually worked with me and created what is a full-time position for me that incorporates several other jobs all under the director of education umbrella. So I also still do the grant writing for them. And I also work as the office manager for the theater. And collectively that then becomes a full-time position. And with all of that, I have had to learn a lot of new stuff, much of it kind of on the fly. But I think the biggest two things that I took with me from my PhD into this role are my ability to do research quickly and efficiently and to then distill that research down into something that I can convey to other people. And that's happening in the grant space in particular recently. I've been applying for a lot of education grants and in that been doing research into the impact of the performing arts on academic performance in other areas. So I'm reading these massive longitudinal reports from the National Endowment for the Arts and then pulling, okay, here's what we need for this grant and writing our narrative around those figures that someone else has already done all that long-term research for. So that's one element that I think is really important is research and then conveying that to a non-specialist audience, super important. And then also my presentation skills. I've had to do quite a few pitches now for grants where we've gotten to a final round that is a verbal pitch. And then also I do pre-show talks. And so the teaching comes into effect there. And I give lectures. I also work with teachers to build educational materials for their classes. So it's actually a lot of different aspects of both my professional development and my academic development. Perfect. Uh, go ahead, Lydia. Uh, that was really, I mean, it's interesting. Betsy and I have very different jobs, but so many of those transferable um, components that she pulled from her PhD program are really similar to, to the work that I do um, now at the NCAA. Um, when I finished my PhD, um, I was first on um, the faculty at the University of Arizona as a professor of practice for a few years. Um, and my research, though, I mean, as you saw from the title of my dissertation, has always been on the the academic and the social experience of college student athletes. And I've always been very, very interested in it. And I talked our higher ed department um, into allowing me to teach current issues in intercollegiate athletics like every other year, because that was what I really wanted to teach. So they would let me do it on the side. Um, and then I was able to teach a course on like youth community sport engagement or something um, for undergrads every year. But all of that was never part of my actual job. It was always on the side, but that was where I always got the most um, excited. So when this opportunity came open at the NCAA, um, you know, the, the NCAA national office is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, there are just under 500 full-time staff members um, that support 1,100 member institutions or 500,000 student athletes um, across the country and including one school in Canada, Simon Fraser. Um, and we do have a research department. There are five of us um, on staff who are all um, methodologists. And most of us have PhDs. We do have an epidemiologist on staff um, and she has a master's in public health. Um, but there are others who have PhDs in our research department. Um, but so much of our work is really um, translating complex research and, and data to a, a very smart, but a very general audience to help them make informed decisions um, using that data, whether it's you know, talking about 
student athlete transfer pathways, whether it's talking about um, you know the, the success and the retention and persistence of student athletes and trying to use the data from you know millions of student athletes, both high school and term by term college data to kind of um, make those decisions. Um, are using survey research. Um, so much of our job is in um, you know, designing those questions, analyzing that data, but then being able to present it um, to an audience. And whether that's an audience of college presidents or college students or athletics directors or football coaches, um, all of them um, need this data. And so the opportunity to kind of um, come up with you know, ways to really weave the data into a, an understandable and, and in you know, informative story um, definitely kind of takes into account some of my work in teaching. Um, and then also, I really had the benefit of having a great um, graduate assistantship with our advanced program. We had an advanced grant at the University of Arizona, um, and that was working um, really to increase the, the number, uh, increase and retain um, both women and women and people of color in the STEM fields at, at Arizona. Um, but a lot of the work that we did in that capacity as, as GAs was in presenting to department chairs um, and department heads across, across the campus. Um, and so a lot of my experience in those opportunities, you know, in presenting and presenting data, um, presenting to people who were, um, you know, um, definitely, um, very, you know, senior to, to what I was, um, you know, in terms of their seniority um, on campus. Um, you know, I, I think it maybe it makes me fairly comfortable presenting to college presidents um, when I'm when I'm sharing data with them. Um, so I definitely think leaning on both my um, GA ship, but then also my my training um, academically is a really important piece. Um, and then of course, you know, those those skills and in, in writing are something that I use a lot. Um, we're always trying to, you know, they're we definitely do still have the opportunity to do some publication um, in, in academic spaces, but then also creating a lot of policy documents or research briefs um, that are you know, more broadly digestible is something that I've definitely you know, been honing my skills in. But you know, thanks to all that, all that opportunity to write <laughs> as a grad student, um, it definitely makes it a lot easier. Wow, uh, I love hearing that. Uh, and and it's, it's so interesting that no matter what your dissertation was on, those skills are things that you can transfer, those research skills, those writing skills, those presentation skills, those teaching skills are things that just transfer to so many different ways. And I'm gonna encourage folks also to just, um, you know, uh, 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 turn your cameras on. We love seeing faces, we love seeing, I've seen a lot of great room colors, a lot of great room art, uh, dogs, cats, you name it, kids, babies, you know, lunch, we're happy to have you eat lunch with us. Uh, we understand it's your lunch hour, so, uh, you know, uh, I have, I've met many cute babies this past two years. So, uh, and, you know, people walking around. So, you know, we're happy to have uh, whatever. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, I've been told that a PhD without at least some publications is not taken seriously. Uh, is this true? What has been your experience? And Lydia, we'll start with you first. I, I think it depends on your on your audience, you know, in terms of who's taking you seriously, right? Um, I, I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the, one thing I like to think about is that, you know, writing your dissertation, writing a lot of uh, publications and academic journals, um, you know, I couldn't even get my mom to get past my, my intro chapter, right? Um, which is not, not a great sign. Um, and I think one thing I really love about my job now um, is that a lot of the publications that I have in terms of uh, membership, like public facing, you know, whether it's a research brief or something, what's amazing is that the data that we're able to gather um, from student athletes or from coaches, you know, we, these open surveys, you know, we're able to gather that data, distill it, analyze it, and publish it within a six month time frame. And then we're able to roll it out to hundreds, if not thousands of people who have an opportunity to see it, um, whether that's the media or campuses or student athletes. Um, and so sometimes when I, I think about, you know, publications, you know, one beauty of the work that I do now is that I'm able to impact people who took my survey while they're still on campus. Uh, and so often in academia, a lot of the work that you gather and, and data that you pull together, by the time you make it through all the rigors of pulling it together into a into a journal and finally going you know, getting past reviewer number two, which is you know always a daunting challenge, and then finally getting it out there. 
by the time it's finally published, you know, these people, it's maybe six, eight years from when the data were originally gathered. It's so much has changed in terms of context. Um, and then the, the scope of who's, who's reading it and reflecting on it, you know, is, is a very small sphere. Um, and so I, I do think that's one of the really neat things about being in a space, in a public facing, you know, nonprofit world where you do have a little bit more visibility and your work maybe has a, a broader extension. At the same time, though, um, I think that is a valid question. There are times when, you know, I can have a survey with 40,000 people who've taken it and I have some phenomenal, you know, super interesting findings. Um, but then, you know, someone else who has a, a sample of, you know, 500 um, and, and a case study, but that does make it into a high impact journal, um, may have some more credibility. I think it depends on your audience. It depends on, you know, the way that you interact with people and the impression that you leave. Um, and so I, I think, I mean, that's, it's a very valid question. So I don't have a million publications, um, but that's, I think I can find value in the work that I do outside of, you know, a, 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 an impact factor. I would say that also I, I have to say it depends. Um, I had one pending publication at the time that I was on the job market. And uh, in a similar kind of vein, it was it was accepted for publication in I think it was 2017, and it was not even a back and forth of reviewers type of thing. It was just all kinds of holdups in the publishing process that I knew it was accepted. It had been peer reviewed. I had done my revisions, and we moved forward with it. And then it just sort of sat in limbo for a number of reasons that were totally unconnected to me, unconnected to the editors of the volume. And it was just kind of sitting there and I was like, yep, it's pending. It's pending. And then it finally came out this year. And so that was, yeah, it was, it was a journey for that. And so I do think that if you are trying for an academic career path, absolutely, for better or worse, yes, your publications matter. For me, in my non-academic applications, I was never once asked about that ever in any of the interviews that I made it to. I was asked much more, and this has to do with what I was applying for, and I think that's the key thing to think about in whether or not those publications or lack thereof will matter. I was asked much more frequently about my grant success rate. And so I was coming to those interviews prepared with, here's how many I've applied for, here's how many I've won. That represents this amount of money, which is this much of my theater's operating budget. And then, you know, for myself as a scholar, I've won these many out of this many that I've applied for. And you have to think when you're talking about things like that, about making sure you frame it in a way that ensures your positioning, your success. Because the biggest example that I can give of that is one job that I applied for was in a development position for a major R1 university. When they are applying for funding at a university, the scale is so different than what you're applying for as a nonprofit performing arts organization. And so what I went into that interview with was not saying I raised $50,000 in a single year, but saying I multiplied our grant income tenfold in my first year as the grant writer for this organization. And that was completely accurate, but that sounds way better than, yeah, they only got five grand in grants before they hired me. So I think whatever you do have, make sure that you create a narrative around your successes and position those really critically. Whether you feel like there's something missing, if that's publications or grants or whatever it is, don't ignore it if they ask you about it, but just really lean on what you do have. Perfect. Thank you. And you're right. It's so situational. But again, even going back to that first question, right, like leaning into your skills, make sure you can articulate those skills and meet, you know, the job description or the environment that you're going to be working in. Yeah, that's some great advice. Thank you. And there's some, some sounds like a lot that resonated with a lot of people, you know, looking at the chat. 
So another question here is kind of around internships and preparing and getting real, real work experience, you know, put that in quotations there. Uh, but is it necessary to do an internship during your PhD in order to go into a specific job industry? Um, from your experience, do companies prefer to have someone who has done an internship versus someone who has only done either research or teaching? So, uh, Betsy, do you want to start this one off? Yeah. I, so I will answer this both in terms of myself and from when I was a graduate assistant at the U of A and what I saw in my position there when I was working with multiple career pathways and doing a lot of alumni interviews. For myself, it is 100% critical that I had already been working for this theater before I asked for what I asked for. They knew me and they felt like I was someone who they trusted to step into a position that they created for me. And I can guarantee that would not have happened had I not already had a history with them. And I, I wish that I could say that it would be different and that everyone would get that same opportunity that I did just coming in off the sidewalk but I, I recognize that it was very much because I had a foot in the door. I mean, I had like half my body in the door, if we're being honest. Um, and so I do recommend that if there's a sector that you want to get into, try to get a paid position there. Do not take on anything unpaid. Your time as a graduate student is way too precious to let yourself be exploited by someone who wants your intelligence and your drive and doesn't wanna pay you for it. You deserve that payment. So I will say that. And in addition, when I was studying the multiple career pathways that alums went into, the story that I saw over and over again was that people who leave academia had some kind of experience in the field that they went into, whether that was an internship or even something like I had where it's just a kind of related job that you can then parlay into what you do want, try to get that foot in the door in some way. I, it's really critical. And even if it doesn't turn into an exact job, it'll still help you figure out whether or not that's where you want to be. And that was really helpful for me too, because I was able to say, gosh, I'm happiest when I'm in front of a group of people just getting to tell them how great theater is. And yes, that absolutely happens in academia, but working in the theater made me realize that it could happen in a lot of other spaces too. I think for me, you know, I, I'm in a research department, which is a little different. I mean, that's obviously, I mean, the expectation is that you do have a, a strong background in, in, a, in an academia kind of setting. Right. I mean, my managing director is a former faculty member at University of Denver. He's a quantitative psychologist. My coworkers are, you know, I have a, there's a, one who has a background in econometrics. So it's a little different in that space. Um, but I do think that, you know, as I said earlier, I, I really feel like my opportunities I had through GA ships, um, being able to use those as, um, you know, fodder for a lot of my discussions and my answers in my interview process was incredibly valuable to me. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I, I did have the traditional CV because I was also looking for faculty jobs, right? But, I, but then I had a, a resume and it was only a, a two-pager. Um, but for every, any job that I applied for, I really rewrote my resume every time. And, you know, definitely started out with relevant skills and really took what were the key pieces of that job description and the key things that were necessary and then tried to draw from my various opportunities, whether it was internships or GA ships, what, where could I draw those lines of relevancy and show that trend and those transferable skills. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the, I review resumes all the time um, for people who we've, we've had two job searches in the past year. Um, and I will say that, you know, clearly in our job description, there are certain things we're looking for. We're looking for, you know, some, some background and, you know, we want, we want to know, you know, how to use some kind of qualitative stuff, quantitative software. We don't really care which one you use. We want to know that you know how to use it, but I can't tell you how many people don't even list that on their resume. And then you're combing through, like hoping, do they know, 
is there any is there any sign that they possibly know how to use you know SAS or STATA or SPSS? Um, because it was something that we clearly said was a required skill, um, and that it's so easy to dismiss a, a two-page resume that doesn't include that. Um, I'm also struck lately, um, you know, a lot of companies are not requiring cover letters, um, but when I do receive a cover letter that walks me through why someone is a good fit and why their skills are relevant and helps me kind of provides a narrative to help me read through their resume, I definitely give am much more likely to give them um, a closer look because they've really helped me through it. Um, you know, just because it's not required doesn't mean that we're not looking at it. And that, that's been a huge piece and it really helps you know, sometimes people's compelling stories are the, are what bring you into wanting to, um, you know, bring them in for that interview and to hear hear more and learn more about them. Even sometimes when they see them, you know, maybe they're not, maybe they don't have every single thing, but there's something about the way that they're selling themselves that, or some way that they're couching their skills that you're like, oh, I think we can maybe draw some connections. Let's bring them in and have a chat. Um, I just think that's such an important piece um, is really thinking about, especially in opportunities outside of academia, how you're going to be um, approaching these opportunities and the way that you're going to be sharing yourself in your in your resume and especially your cover letter um, is just very 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 different from academia. Nobody wants to read a seven page CV. They really want a one or a two page resume that really highlights your skills and why you're a valuable asset to their to their organization. I do want to add one more thing that Lydia's comments reminded me of. For some people, uh, especially international students, I know that working outside of the university isn't feasible. And my recommendation in that case is try to get different positions within the university. If you can do both a teaching assistantship and some other kind of assistantship, go for that. So exactly as Lydia was saying, just try to get a breadth of experience within whatever confines are on you in terms of your work. Wow, I didn't hire either of them, uh, but I, 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 if you can see my feet, I'm tap dancing for joy right now uh, to hear both of you um, talk about uh, experiences and yes, tailoring resumes and cover letters. Um, that's, that's very exciting to hear. It's something we talk about a lot for, for students. Um, and I wanna go back to just one thing. Um, both of you have talked a lot about how the things that you got from teaching um, have been really helpful. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you couched that. So how did you talk about that? For instance, either in your resume or in your cover letter to explain to somebody, here's how my teaching experience can help me do your job. And Betsy, do you wanna go ahead? Sure. I think one of the things that I talked about was managing multiple tasks and recognizing priority among them, as well as time management for all of those elements. And the example that I gave was when we in the English department are doing one-on-one -on -one student meetings at the same time that my own midterm essays are due. And you just have to say, okay, I'm giving this much time to this task. And when that amount of time is over, I have to shut the door on it and move back to my own work. And a perfect example of that is actually this week for me at work, I have four different things that I'm all trying to keep from exploding or falling off or whatever the case may be. So we have multiple schools coming on field trips to the theater and I have to make sure that I'm coordinating with all of those teachers. I am drawing up contracts for the actors who are going to be in our next production. I am making sure that all of our donors are getting thank you notes. There was just a big nonprofit campaign, Arizona Gives Day, that ended yesterday. And so I'm just trying to make sure that all of these elements stay on track and teaching, and in this case, teaching alongside my research is really critical to being able to do that because we understand as instructors that we have tons of tasks. You have to keep lesson planning. There's always more grading. There's always another meeting that you have to go to. And so those types of demands on your time, I think really prepared me well for having a job that has so many moving parts that are, I mean, all related under the theater, but really unrelated to each other in terms of getting them done. 
I think those are all great examples. I think the other, the only other thing I would add is that um, in my role and, and true for Betsy's role too, there's a lot of opportunity for public speaking and communicating to a, a, wide, a very diverse audience. Um, and being having the opportunity to have worked with first year undergrads and seniors and doctoral students, um, you know, definitely has prepared me um, to be able to, to speak to a wide range of people, but then also to pivot on the fly. Who can do that better than, um, you know, a GA, right, Who's who has a class? And sometimes a conversation just takes off in a different direction, or sometimes, you know, there's something that will happen, and, you know, you suddenly have to pivot. Your, your guest speaker cancels on you, and you got to put something together. Um, I think, you know, Teachers are, are fantastic improvisationalists, um, but that really helps us kind of navigate, um, you know, the, the other aspects of public speaking too. So I, I would definitely, you know, if, you're, if the position you're interested in has that opportunity, um, working, you know, the opportunity to work with a wide range of others or to serve a broad spectrum of customers uh, or to, you know, share findings with them. I mean, there's so many ways that your opportunity, your experiences as, as a TA um, can definitely tie into those. Um, those job interview questions. Perfect. Great. Well, this has been an awesome discussion. And I love the you know, points that were made in this last question about you know, really being able to talk about your experience and connect it and share it in a way where maybe some people might not have gone through a PhD program or higher education and then gone through the rigors of that and truly being able to identify how this relates to different, uh, different roles. One question that I have, and you can put back your, your PhD hat when you were a student uh, getting, going through your program, um, you know, what were your career aspirations at that time? And did you know that this is where you eventually wanted to be? Was this the end all goal? And if not, how did you kind of find your way and find that journey and find these different opportunities on how your skills would apply. Lydia, do you want to maybe start that off? Sure. I I, was, I really wanted the faculty route, so I'm not, I mean, I'm the best one to be asking this of. Um, I really wanted the faculty route, but I finished my PhD in 09. Um, and so I was on the market in 08, um, right when the markets just plummeted and crashed. And I know I was even, um, I was a finalist for two um, faculty positions and then they canceled the searches. And so I, I definitely had to pivot. There was just nothing available. Um, and I really needed to think what, what to do next. And so for a little bit, I, I carved out um, two part-time postdocs and convinced people that, that it was cheaper to hire me <laughs> than, to, than to bring on a GA because the FTE was lower. Um, so I, I did do that for a little bit. And then I stayed on as an assistant professor of practice. Um, what was really cool is that this position opened um, at the NCAA. Um, it was I had I didn't I had I knew of the research department, um, and I had I had actually you know reached out to them a couple times during my dissertation. So I knew that they existed, and I knew the, the kinds of data that they collected. Um, but I they had not had an opening in years, and so I, this was not even on my radar. Um, but then when this position came open, um, you know a friend reached out and said, hey, I just want to make you aware of this opportunity. And what was really interesting is I, I read the job description and I was like, oh, I don't think I'm a good fit. There, there are nine criteria and I only meet like five. Um, and which definitely there's a lot of research that talks about how women um, sometimes, especially undersell themselves and are really tentative about applying for something if they don't meet every single criteria. Um, men are much more likely to apply for a position even if they don't meet all the criteria. Um, but someone convinced me and I had just, I had actually just had a baby. Uh, my daughter was only a couple months old. So I really had nothing to lose. I had a job. Um, and so I kind of went on a whim and I figured I'm just going to, and I, I told them I had just had a baby. I even asked for, I, I was still breastfeeding. And so I told them that during the interview, I needed time to pump. And I figured if this was gonna throw them off, um, then I didn't wanna work for them anyway. But I was I was lucky because I was not in a position, I, I had a job, right? Um, so I I think that's, that's how this kind of all came to be. It was not a, a place that I, I thought, I mean, I, I love the work that I do. The chance to do research on intercollegiate athletics 
full time was definitely, you know, an aspiration, but I, I wasn't aware of kind of working in this space. I thought it would happen in academia, um, but it really worked out to be a really amazing opportunity. Um, and I'm so glad that I took the chance and I felt that I, you know, I, I didn't have much to lose. Um, and I was able, you know, even though I didn't meet all nine criteria, um, I was still able to, to become their, their top, um, their top candidate. So um, I would definitely encourage people to, um, you know, if you do see something that you think is, you know, is of interest to you and that you'd be very enthusiastic about, um, definitely don't sell yourself short, um, you know, really give yourself the opportunity. You may just be the candidate that they're looking for. Um, but I, um, I definitely now would give anyone that pep talk, um, especially women who, who feel they don't meet every single criteria. Um, but I, I think that's an important leap to take. Um, but no, it was not something that I had long planned for. Um, and, but I'm, I'm very, very happy that I had this opportunity. And how great that you had people there to kind of champion you and sponsor you and, and boo you up to, to take yeah. the step. Right. I yeah, think that's kind absolutely. of a subtle, <laughs> yeah. a subtle plug for networking and mentoring, but totally. Yep. I think you're I think you're completely right. Is that having people to say, you know, ah, you still should apply. Like what do you have to lose? Um it was it, that's a really important thing to hear. It's kind of, you know, I think oftentimes um if there's a career that you're interested in or just a job you want to know more about, um, I you know, there's always I do informational interviews all all the time. I would say probably once a month, I talk to a doctoral student who's interested in possible careers in, you know, collegiate athletics outside of academia. Um, and I, I think, you know, people, people ask me and if I can fit it in, I'm happy to talk about what I do and to give them some tips and opportunities. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in something, you know, outside the box um, and you know, informational interviews, the worst you're going to hear is no. Um, so reaching out to someone and saying, hey, you know, your position sounds amazing. I'm wondering if you could talk about how you were able to, you know, to, to pursue this career path. Um, if they can have time and can fit you in, um, I think, you know, I would definitely reach out. The other really cool thing that I think COVID has, um, you know, one really neat, you know, um, outcome of the pandemic is that people now are much more comfortable doing you know, Zoom conversations or teams. So even if it's not somebody down the street, if it's someone seriously across the country, um, reaching out again, the worst they're going to say is no, or they're going to ignore your email, but it never, it never hurts. Um, and people are much more comfortable having these kinds of virtual conversations nowadays. So I would definitely encourage people to take that pathway. Perfect. Thank you, Lydia. Bessie, do you want to maybe share your story and, and advice? Yes, so I I agree. As I said at the beginning of this, I was encouraged by someone who I spoke to in an informational interview to take the steps that I did. And so again, you know, exactly as Lydia said, this was uh, something that I did. I sent probably at least a dozen cold emails to people all over the country asking for informational interviews. And the woman who ended up getting back to me, Katie Grace Brown from the Atlanta Shakespeare Company, has turned into a mentor for me. She did that original informational interview. After I got the position, I emailed her and was just like, thank you so much. I can't say enough how important it was to me that you told me to go for this and talked me through how to make the pitch. And basically you know, as Lenny was saying, encouraged me to do this thing that really honestly frightened me. And so then after that, she emailed me back and said, oh, I'm so thrilled for you. If I can ever help you out, please let me know. And she and I now have monthly Zoom chats where we just catch up. We talk about what's happening at our theaters. And she has really coached me through some of the challenges on the job and that's incredibly important for me because in my position, this is a brand new position at my theater. No one has done it before me here. And so there's no one for me locally to turn to, to ask, hey, what's happening in this situation? This is weird, right? And so having her as a resource has been really phenomenal. So there's that. Um, going back to the original question, no, I did not originally see myself going on this career path. <laughs> I also came into graduate school 100% assuming that I was going to become a professor at a four-year institution of some kind. And for me, 
it was twofold that I did not end up taking that path. One, I started realizing in 2016 that there might be another option because in 2016, Shakespeare's first folio came to the U of A's campus, specifically the Arizona State Museum, as part of the nationwide tour for the 400th anniversary. And uh, sorry, for Shakespeare's 400th birthday, it wasn't the 400th anniversary of the folio, that feels like an important distinction. Um, <laughs> and so uh, when that came to campus, my mentor on campus, Meg Loda Brown, encouraged me to reach out to the State Museum and find out if there was some kind of capacity where I could work with them on that uh, installation and on all of the programming that was going to surround it. And in doing that, I ended up working as a docent at the museum several days a week, leading school tours and talking to them about the first folio. I helped the uh, director of education at the museum put together a weekend event that was this really great, you know, multi uh, multimodal event that had performances and activities and very family friendly. I also helped coordinate between the museum and special collections because special collections did a whole uh, companion exhibit that went with the folio. And then Tucson Festival of Books came in the middle of that and I helped with the events for that as well. And so in doing all of that, not only was it all great experience that I later got to write about in cover letters, but also I realized how energized I felt when getting to do this outward facing educational work. And this was really eye opening for me and became something that I started keeping an eye out for where I was like, okay, museums, libraries, theaters, they all have educational programming that's not taking place in a classroom. And I'm always gonna love classroom teaching. And honestly, if an opportunity arises for me to shift back, I might at some point. But for now, it's really exciting to be doing community-oriented education. And it's very different all the time because, um, for example, on Tuesday, the groups that we had at the theater were sixth grade, third grade, eighth grade, and second grade. And then on Friday, we're going to have sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at the theater. And I'm making educational materials that can be quickly adapted for basically anyone K-12. And so having that sort of malleability is really fun for me. And every week being different is really fun for me. So that's something that I encourage you to consider. We talked earlier about the employment benefits of taking on lots of roles, seizing lots of opportunities while you're still in school, but also just opening your own mind to outside possibilities is really important because I would say by the time that I finished, it was probably in terms of my job applications, a 25-75 split of 25% academic applications and 75% nonprofit and non-academic education. I love uh, hearing that you both went outside and did the dreaded networking word um, I, and, and that it went so well. And it is, people are, especially, you know, U of A alum and people across the country are just incredibly gracious. Um, and, and I think you're right, it's a great time to, to Zoom and, and talk to people. Um, one of the questions I always get is, how did you bring this up to your advisor? Um, uh, you know, that especially in the humanities, that discussion of, so I'm maybe not gonna be a mini me. I'm maybe not gonna go and, and, and do uh, what, what you might think I'm gonna do. And so I'm, I'm wondering how, Olivia, I'll start with you uh, this time, how, how you has handled that conversation. Well, I was still on the faculty track. So when I um, finished my, I was on the, you know, I was a professor of practice at U of A for five years before this happened. So I did not, <laughs> I did not consult with my advisor when I took the job, um, but I, um, you know, I think for for me, um, because I had been a professor of practice um, and I wasn't on the tenure track, um, I think this opportunity 
you know, it, I think it would have been different had I been on the tenure track. I, I may have, you know, I was already five years in, I may have stuck with it, but because this opportunity came around um, and was the opportunity to do what I wanted to do, you know, full time, um, it was, and, and they were enthusiastic about having me. Um, I, that was just, it was just a, a point in my life. I think it was a really neat opportunity and I was just willing to take it. Um, but in talking, you know, back when I was a student, um, you know, my advisor, we, we definitely thought I was taking the faculty track. So I, um, the challenge was for, for so many of us who graduated that year, it was because of the, the market kind of imploding. Um, there were many of us who kind of were put into a faculty limbo. Um, many of us were looking into postdoc opportunities or, you know, other ways to extend, um, you know, our, our time as we were waiting for faculty positions to reopen. So I'm not the best one. I didn't have that conversation with my faculty advisor. And, and Betsy, I know you've alluded to this a little, and I will just say, uh, Betsy's advisor's on the line. So, uh, uh, but, but I have a feeling this is going to go well. <laughs> yes. So I will say I was incredibly lucky to have Meg Loda Brown as my advisor because she was already so aware of the grave problems on the academic job market. And she is very in touch with the realities of the many, many places that your PhD can take you and that success comes in a huge number of forms and that success is gonna look different for every single student. And so uh, one of the things that she said to me that was incredibly touching was, I don't care who you wanna work for. It could be Microsoft, it could be evil Facebook. I'll write you that letter. And so, you know, that having that support, to be honest, I don't think, I ever had to have like the breaking the ice conversation with her, but I was in that unique position that she was already on board. And I, I may have had a conversation with her after I mentioned that folio experience. I think I may have said to her at that time, you know, I think I might look for positions like this. And from that time on, she was really supportive of that. And all I can say is if your mentor or advisor is not equally supportive, go talk to Meg Loda. She will help you figure out how to communicate to them in a way that will get them in your corner the way that you need them to be. Sorry, Meg Loda, I'm making more work for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but excellent advice. Thank you. And, you know, as we're getting closer to the end of our of our hour discussion here, I just want to do a, a quick last minute thoughts, you know, thinking back to um, advice that you wished maybe you would have had as a PhD student um, that maybe we can share as our as our last question here. So, um, you know, Betsy, do you want to start us off and then Lydia, you can shut the door on it. <laughs> I think my pieces of advice, I'll do one academic piece and one non-academic piece. Um, academically, do more interdisciplinary stuff earlier. I absolutely loved my experience in the history department, which was secondary to my English degree, of course, but I was able to make so many really great connections with other scholars who were interested in my time period, which I felt like was kind of missing in the English department. I had faculty members who worked in my field and in my time period, but not many peers. And so sometimes it felt kind of lonely and getting into another academic space where I did have that overlap with other peers felt really good and was invigorating and ended up shaping the course that my dissertation work took. Having that history and English presence was really fun and also, quite honestly, opened my eyes to a lot of possibility in terms of my research and took me to new places too with conferences and professional connections. So interdisciplinary work, which, you know, the Grad Center helps facilitate also, is something that will really broaden your academic and just kind of generally your critical thinking horizons. 
And then my non-academic piece of advice is set boundaries for yourself. And those boundaries can be something like, hey, at the end of the day, I'm going to turn off my computer and not check my email again for 10 hours. Or if I get this big assignment done, then I'm going to take Saturday off completely and go for a hike. Whatever the boundaries are for you, protect yourself and your well-being during graduate school because it is so easy to approach the burnout place without realizing how close you are to burning out. And then once you've burned out, it's kind of too late. And then you have to start doing a lot of retroactive care rather than just protecting yourself from that crash point. So surround yourself with people who love you. Keep making times for the things that you enjoy that are not connected to your academics and just keep enjoying your life along the way to your PhD. Take care of yourselves. Good advice for everybody. <laughs> Get some sleep. Um, uh, I think um, I I think Betsy's suggestion early on about um, you know taking opportunity of not only research assistantships but then also other graduate assistantships that provide you with more experiential opportunities. Um, I think it, that's a great suggestion, and especially if if you do think that you're someone who may not want to you know, spend the rest of your life in academia, finding those other spaces and testing things out through a GA ship is an awesome way um, to, you know, receive some funding, but then also to, to test to test things. Um, and the other thing I would say, um, you know, is what I mentioned earlier, again, never, you know, creating your, um, you know, finding a list of people with whom you'd like to speak and then reaching out to them, uh, again, the, the worst, nothing terrible is going to happen. You just may not hear back from them. Only good can come from it. So it's just, it's not a waste of your time at all, um, especially if you have a story like Betsy's, you know, finding a mentor from across the country because of a random email, like how lucky is that? Um, so I, I just think that's a, that's a great, that's a great piece to hear from. Um, and yeah, the other piece I would say is that um, if you, if you are interested in something outside of academia, finding someone who, from whom you can get resume um, building advice who is not in academia is very important. It's great to reach out to your faculty advisor and your committee members for help with your CV, absolutely. Um, but they are not the best ones to help you, you know, twist and turn all your experiences into a very usable resume. And so Career Services is there on campus. It's there for you. They do work with grad students and can be super valuable. Um, so I, I just think getting getting someone's feedback um, you know, on, on your resume and your cover letter outside of academia, it's just such a different letter than you would write for a faculty position. And it's completely understandable that your advisor would not know how to craft that letter. So you need to find someone who, who can give you some tips and just provide some, some feedback on your writing. Um, I think that's a really important piece. I love that. I really, someone's going to think I paid these people. Um, <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah. And uh, just to follow up, we actually have a new series. So at the Graduate Center, we uh, have folks to help you, myself and another uh, fabulous uh, uh, graduate student advisor, career advisor, you can make appointments with us. I put in the link the uh, place where you can go and make appointments uh, to meet every Friday morning from 9 to 11. Uh, you can go to also to the trellis. We have drop-in hours. You can come and get career advising, ask us to look over a resume. And uh, it's, it's just finished, but we've actually got a new series on preparing for business, nonprofit, and government job applications. Uh, and I think it's going to run again this summer. So stay tuned uh, and, and look for that. We'll try to get that information out. Uh, because we know it is very different than uh, applying for, for a faculty uh, position. So we're here to help you with all things uh, career from, I don't know what I want to do with my life, uh, to <laughs> figuring out how to go about getting a job, applying for a job, and, uh, and interview prep. So we're here to, to help you with everything here at the uh, Graduate Center. Um, and I have put that link in. And Lacey, do you want to talk about the Bear Down Network? Yes, this was mentioned a lot, woven into many different questions, but the importance of connection, the importance of finding mentors, uh, and you have a wonderful Wildcat community as uh, displayed here on our panel of people who are able to help and willing to help you along your path and your career journey. So I know that is in the, the link is in the chat there, but you can join the Bear Down Network, find people willing to help, 
and connect and communicate with them on that platform. So if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or Sean or anyone else. Thank you and thank you to our panelists. This has been fantastic. And we will share this recording with everyone to uh, allow you to follow up on some of the conversations that we had today. Yes, thank you both to our fabulous panelists. Thank you to, to Lacey. And thank you everybody for coming and spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, I know I learned stuff uh, and it's very exciting to uh, see U of Alum do such fabulous things. So thank you so very much, everybody. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.